by the time that I had realized that I really, really was disordered in my eating approach, I think it had already pretty much set in and I'd had it for like best part of like four or five years then. So saying to me, like, you know, getting rid of that was was terrifying because that was very much a real part of me. G'day and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are talking with David Chawner, author of the anorexia memoir, Weight Expectations. One man's recovery from anorexia. For the past month, we have been talking with females who have gone through anorexia. But today, we cover the important perspective of male anorexia. Dave is a comedian and mental health advocate who started developing anorexia in his adolescence. He has since recovered and his book came out in 2018. He has given a TED talk on the subject of anorexia and some of his comedy is based around the condition. Hello Dave and welcome to Wellbeing. Thank you very much for having me. It's genuinely lovely to be here. Let's start off with your book, Weight Expectations, One Man's Recovery for Anorexia. How did it come to be? You know what, it's a very good question because a lot of people, I feel bad. Like a lot of people set out to do, to write a book and, and all that sort of stuff. I've got to be honest, I uh, I didn't. And a lot of people are surprised that I can read, let alone write. But what actually happened was I, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a TED talk and then a publisher approached me and said, look, there's a gap in the market for the first male book on anorexia. And uh, said, you know, would you like to write? it and i suppose the the rest is history it's weird though because actually with the process i nearly walked away from the contracts like quite a few times and, and publishing is like a weird sort of thing anyway because it i think i'm i'm used to being a stand-up comic you get like that initial hit of laughter and you know if something has worked or not but with with writing a book it just takes so long that you, you don't know really yeah, and I think you mentioned a good point there with the you said there was a gap in the market with that male um perspective. I mean, how do you find that like as someone that kind of went through anorexia as a male that like is there like is it different going through it as a male kind of thing? I mean, like honestly, I always kind of say like I, I always think, you know, I wouldn't be expected to be treated differently if I was a man, woman or trans, if I went to the dentist or what with my mental health. But I, I do think that you you know, sort of recent research suggest that anywhere between 10 and 25 percent of anorexics are men so generally it does you know affect female counterparts but the only time i've ever been very aware of being a man was i was going through therapy for the anorexia and i was dating this girl and she'd actually dumped me three times like because this real on off thing and i was in a really vulnerable space and uh, one of my mates said look why don't you go to group therapy for anorexia and there's only one group therapy there and I remember I turned up and I sort of said, you know, my name's Dave and I'm here because I'm currently going through therapy for anorexia and I've just been dumped. And I think one of the things about the anorexia is I'm lonely uh, and I kind of want to find someone. And, and then they're like, the next girl went like, hi, my name's Josie and I'm here because I've been recovered for the last three years, but I haven't dated anyone in the past five years and my number is 077 and i was like this is speed dating right and it yeah, felt yeah, yeah. I, i've got to admit i was like that was the only time i was like this is this is bad but good at the same time <laughs> <laughs> yeah right is, is it different like is it different going through it though as a dude i mean like is it a different experience like did, and do different things cause it or like what do you reckon I think I think there's certainly been able to all honest. I think there are more cha there are certain challenges that are more difficult for women. For example, I when I actually left treatment, I was I was like overweight, which is like is that success? Is that failure? Yeah. But I do think that men are judged less on their looks than women you know mm, yeah. if you say to a bloke oh you've got a bit porky then you know generally that bloke you know no one likes people commenting on their body but i think i think it's easier to oh yeah you're a bit chubby for a bloke that has different connotations than it does for yeah. people yeah. that are with you know female so i think that is different i think i find it weirder that more blokes 
don't get anorexia. I, I find it weird kind of in a flip side. I don't know how kind of people get through without an eating disorder. And I say that, you know, I've obviously come full circle and I'm at the other side. But I had a conversation with a friend the other day and I, I you know, I normally wouldn't say anything like this. But I, I stupidly thought, oh, you know, he's, he's got a very good relationship with food. And I said, oh, mate, you've uh, you've you've lost weight. And he got really angry. And he was like, no, I've slimmed. I, I've, I've trimmed down. I've trimmed down i've been going to the work and he was really because he's a real like fighter and a body box and he thought the idea of losing weight was terrible it was awful and yeah, to me i was like that's yeah. mad and so i think there are certain challenges for men that you know women don't have of uh you know that that thing I think, well, I think things, something that is both familiar to male and female is generally when you lose weight, people say, well done, which is why it kind of drives me a little bit like clueless that more people don't struggle or at least openly, because if people keep on saying like, congratulations, well done, I don't know anyone who doesn't like getting positive compliments. And the implication there is that putting on weight is bad. So that was kind of one of the things that started it, but also sustained it. Yeah, and I mean, that's a good good point too, because we've had a, a few other people on this show that have kind of gone for eating disorders, and they've mentioned in, in their own stories that it was when they kind of first, like, initially lost that bit of weight, everyone was like, oh, yeah, well done. And so it kind of you know keeps it going on and they go oh well I better lose more then it's like I'll get that you know get that feeling again I mean is that kind of is, is that kind of what you went through as well or was it different for you hugely and I think something about being a bloke that, that blokes come up to me and talk to me about after shows a lot is one of the things about the anorexia is that generally it can tend to numb unwanted emotions unwanted thoughts because it's kind of like you know if you don't put any fuel in your car it won't run if you don't feed your brain then it will start shutting down and one of the things that i didn't like and one of the reasons that i can't help to think why eating disorders are so prevalent uh during teenage years is as i started to go through puberty i started to get all of these you know sexual urges and stuff and a that was like pretty terrifying but B, I think I was fed a kind of narrative that blokes only want one thing and blokes are all out for sex. So there was a kind of, um, there was a weird twisted narrative there because on the one hand, I was thinking, you know what, I never want to objectify anybody. I never want to treat anyone different based on their looks. However, as I started going through puberty, I, you know, started to find people more attractive. And if I went up and acted on that, let's say I saw a, an attractive woman in a bar, if I went and spoke to her, I'm only doing that because I find her attractive. So I'm only doing that based on her looks. And I couldn't work out how you can have a libido, but not objectify people. And genuinely just starving out that urge was so much easier and starving out that kind of masculinity and all of those things kind of made me i felt at the time like a blank slate do, do you think it's something that gradually happens like it's you know it starts off as a little thought and then it kind of just spirals from there is that kind of what you found i, I completely agree and i think i think that's common to very uh, like pretty much most mental health problems bar like a couple like you know ptsd and stuff because with with things like that there is you know seemingly a lot of the time a start point but with mental health problems generally you live with your brain day to day so trying to understand when it's gone a little bit wonky is really difficult because you see them day in day out it's kind of like knowing when your eyesight has got a little bit rubbish there isn't a one moment where you're like oh i'm short-sighted it will be you know you'll be waiting for a train and you can't see something you'll be driving and think oh god that's a bit fuzzy and it's exactly the same for me with mental illness. And I think by the time that I had realized that I really, really was disordered in my eating approach, I think it had already pretty much set in and I'd had it for like best part of like four or five years then. So saying to me, like, you know, getting rid of that was was terrifying because that was very much a real part of me so it was like saying to someone you know you're going to get rid of your job you're like oh god that's that's terrifying no i don't want to do that you're listening to well-being 
a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is comedian and author David Chawner, where we are discussing his journey with anorexia. How would you describe anorexia to someone that doesn't have it? I mean, like, is it a fear of food? Is it a fear of being overweight? Like, how, how would you frame that? It's a great question, I think. So there are four main types of eating disorder. So anorexia, which is symptomized by restriction. Bulimia, which is strict, uh, symptomized by like a, a quick intake of food, but then trying to get rid of it. And then you've got binge eating disorder, which is like that, but without the getting rid of it. So using food to hide or make yourself feel better. And then one called OSFED, which stands for Otherwise Specified Feeding and Eating Disorders. And that actually makes up for about 50% of all eating disorders. The an- anorexia itself, um, I think it's really difficult. I think one of the things that they all share is that they're using food in a way to cope and that was certainly something that i did in the same way that you know people can use say drink in order to numb themselves in order to hide from things in order to give them courage it was very similar for me so again i don't want to sound like i'm promoting encouraging or even glorifying anorexia but i think it's really short-sighted to pretend that in that person's mind to that person they are always 100 percent terrible i think there is a short term and i have to emphasize a really 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 short-term gain for a longer term detriment so there were certain things about the anorexia i enjoyed for example that control over food for example that numbing of thoughts emotions anxieties um but the longer term detriments stacked up so much more and little things that you know you wouldn't even think about like i'd never considered how you know you're constantly cold and a cold in your bones because you know food is fuel and you're not fueling yourself constant things like dry skin you can't pay attention to anything because your brain is constantly flitting all over the place mood swings but also energy swings as well of like sometimes we're like yeah let's go out let's do this and then and like you know feeling absolutely knackered falling asleep tired can lead to narcolepsy your hair falling out loads of you know sort of longer form things that worry but i think the the thing that really symptomized the anorexia once i knew i got it and once it had taken a grip to me was it 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 was and i was very open and i knew that anorexia had the highest fatality rate of any mental illness so for me it was a passive suicide attempt and i was very open about that of like oh i'm i'm doing this to kill myself Do you think a lot of people that are kind of going through their own anorexia journeys have that kind of, it's almost like a slow suicide almost. Is that the, they feel so like down about themselves that, and they, that that's kind of what it is. Yeah, I I think I I don't, I would, no, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm just a professional idiot, but having (laughs) spoken to a lot of people, I think a lot of people feel um, genuinely just a, a state of like, you know life not worth living and there's the high common prevalences of depression in anorexia because if you're not feeding your body you don't feed your brain so it literally doesn't have the energy in order to create those feel-good chemicals but also everything of like your life starts shutting down so you know you can't really go out and see friends because food is around quite a lot you probably don't want to go out on nights out because of those energy bursts so I, I you know I still to a certain extent but used to get really terrified about the idea of going out to things like Christmas parties and stuff not only because of food not only because of the socialization but I was also like what happens if my energy crashes and I'm like miles from home and I'm like falling asleep uh, you know and and I think I felt very much trapped in my own life and that's why it annoys me when the shock value of trying to sort of try and scare people and go this will kill you I was like yeah I, I know that why do you think I'm doing this it doesn't work to try and shock people out of it 
Yeah, and that, that's an interesting point too because we know that it's the you know that this mental health condition is, has the largest fatality rate. But I mean, how should we then go about that? Then I mean, because I mean that's kind of like almost like we're talking about campaigns against it. I mean, like what what how do we do it then? I mean, like what do you reckon? I personally think there are two very simple things to do. The first being talking positively about recovery rather than negatively about the eating disorder. And what I mean by that is everybody said to me, we're going to take the anorexia away. Recovery was about removing the eating disorder. So no wonder I didn't want to engage in recovery because you're just telling me everything that I've got to lose. You're not telling me anything I've got to gain. So if someone had said to me, you know what, I want to give you back your sense of humor, your sense of fun. I want to be able to help you concentrate. I want you to be able to flourish, to do better at your job, to do things that you enjoy. Yeah, where do I sign up? And that leads secondly to the second point, which is I'm working at the moment of using stand up comedy to create comedy workshops specifically aimed at people with mental health problems but specifically eating disorders to teach them stand-up comedy as a method of recovery because everyone kept on saying to me about my mental health you should just talk but i'd never been given those kind of emotional intelligence tools so saying to me just talk about your mental health is like me giving you an iron bar and an anvil and going go and build me a raw iron gate You're like well where, where do i even start that's mad so actually i'm trying to use comedy in order to build those communication spill, skills so that can people can try and explain what's going on in their mind because i always say trying to explain what's going on in your mind it's like trying to explain a colour to someone who's blind. If you've never seen colour before, how do you even start going about trying to explain that? But I think the bigger thing with the comedy for coping is to try and get people seeing recovery as something positive, something fun, something sustainable, rather than just the absence of the eating disorder. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned your, your comedy work there. I mean, did the anorexia in any way, like, was almost a catalyst for you starting comedy or was that kind of already kind of, you always wanted to be a comedian or like, what was the story there? It's a great question. I think, unfortunately, it's not as as tidy as that. I think what happened was when I went away to university, I remember there was um, there was an act that came out over here and I remember I, I didn't know stand-up comedy was a thing and I remember seeing his DVD with some mates. I was like, oh my God, I don't know what this thing is, but I love it. It was amazing. And so when I went to university, we had, they had a little comedy club that was three quid uh, and you went to see some of the best comedians in the UK. And I loved it. And I think, and it's lovely seeing that now, people that have been to stand up for the first time, because they get really chatty, they get really excited. And one of the things that stuck with me the most about going to see stand up was that all of the comedians were freaks. They were, you know, they they were all kind of like either very verbose, very camp, very weird, very odd. They're kind of cartoonish characters. And that kind of fits into the second thing that I loved is that actually the stuff that they talk about is really dark. You know, it's about being single. It's about being broke. It's about being uncomfortable or terrible at flirting or terrible at sex, whatever it is. And I think the thing that I loved about comedy was that it wasn't about trying to fit in. It was about celebrating difference and standing out. And I thought I would love to be able to cope like these people seemingly do. I would love to be able to take the dark, icky bits of life and be able to look at them in a different way and laugh about them. Was comedy a really important part of, of your own recovery? A crucial, vital. And, and actually, this is something I say to people in workshops as well, that I was incredibly lucky. I, I've been so fortunate and privileged. But my mates were, were great and they knew that something was wrong. They knew I started developing a mental illness when I was at school. And because they were lovely, 
they didn't want to say the wrong thing so they stopped playing pranks on me they stopped telling me jokes they stopped mucking about and actually that was more isolating than the illness in and of itself and of course when i was thoroughly depressed with people treating you like that of course you're not going to get any enjoyment out of life and i remember very specifically at one one thursday that i'd been to therapy it was in march it was like 2012 and i remember coming out and i'd laughed so much and i'd had such a good time that i was like oh god this is the person that i enjoy being i want to be this person and that was such a weird thought for me because for so long i'd been deferring my happiness i will be happy when i get down to x stone i will be happy when i lose x amount of weight i'll be happy when i can fit into these trousers that shirt whatever it was and and actually i think humor was something in the moment that i enjoyed that made me think yeah this is great you're listening to well-being a nationally distributed radio show and podcast my guest today is comedian and author David Chawner, where we are discussing his journey with anorexia. How should friends and family then approach someone that, like, approach like helping someone that's kind of going through these things? Because it seems like that pulling away does more harm than good. And like, yeah, so like, how, how do we, how, how should they go about that? It's a great question. So I always say with friends and family, a couple of things. Firstly, let's not forget that that is a person, not a patient. There's no need to dance around the awkward conversation. So I think that is really important. Secondly, I think it is key to have distractions. A lot of the time people think when you're talking about mental health, it has to be in a quiet room, wearing yoga pants, burning joysticks while sitting on bean bags, listening to Enya. You know, it, it doesn't have to be like that. So I think things like, have a chat while you're having a ball game or on the way to a coffee shop or in the pub or even while playing on the PlayStation, because actually it's a difficult conversation to have, let alone to listen to. So I think positive, fun distractions will help remind that person of their peak person that they want to be so whether that's bowling or whatever it is something fun that you both enjoy have the conversation when you are both at your peak performance i also say as well let's not forget you aren't an expert and you don't have to be an expert in order to talk about mental health so encourage them to talk to one and actually on that point i'll never forget the best person by far and away that i ever spoke to about my own anorexia was my old man And I remember I'd just been diagnosed as severely clinically anorexic on the 22nd of December 2000, and I think it was 11. And I remember I'd have to have fast track treatment, and that was just before Christmas. And obviously Christmas being a festival of food. And I was sitting in the my parents like front room, like with my dad, the little living room. And I'll never forget, he obviously wanted to say something. And he eventually said it, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'll be completely honest, Dave, I don't get it. Like, I've never had an eating disorder. I've never met anyone who's openly had an eating disorder. I don't get it. So know this, that if I say something wrong or clumsy or that might affect you, it doesn't come from a place of malice. It just comes from a place that I don't get this. And that was amazing because it gave me the opportunity to go, you know what, Dad, I, I actually don't get this either and if i did i would stop it i used my body to show there was something wrong with my brain because i didn't have the words to explain emotions so that really took the pressure off for someone to once go you know what i don't get it do you and no should parents and friends like when they're having that conversation if they really don't get it i mean should they just be be up front but still of course understanding kind of thing Absolutely. And I mean, why, why, like, if you haven't had an eating disorder, why would you get it? 
there's a lot of things we're, we're all born into ignorance jesus i'm more ignorant than most right i mean i i could fill a library with the things that i don't know and i think people at source are good so the likelihood is the likelihood is if you are understanding and you come at this from a place of compassion then you're not going to say the wrong thing and i think on that point it's really important to say if you are supporting someone with a you know an eating disorder i think it's really key to say ask don't tell a lot of people kept on telling me that i had anorexia and that was i think to try and shock me to try and get me into treatment but actually fundamentally a lot of the time people say it's about control and all people were doing was just taking yet another thing out of my hands and it was actually when someone said to me you know what i've had therapy for bulimia three times i find this a really difficult environment have you ever thought that you had anorexia that gave me space and openness and the platform in order to kind of go yeah you know what actually for the first time i might realize that this is not normal i mean that arcs don't tell thing i mean that that seems like a really fundamental point here i mean and in, in saying that like just like along with that i mean how can we get people to better understand how to approach these things you know like is it programs is it like what do you reckon i i think we can we can help people uh, like better understand this i think fundamentally two ways one is by understanding mental health and by that i mean everybody has mental health one in four of us has mental illness four in four of us has mental health so instead of talking about the one in four actually talking about the four in four and start to place this at your door and go how am i functioning how is my brain working and treat it in a very down-to-earth way you know like when i twisted my ankle when I was like in my 20s. I'll never forget, I looked at it and my mate turned around and went, Jesus, mate, I'd, I'd go get that checked out. But no one ever talked to me like that about my mental health. And it showed me that we don't treat mental health as like a very real part of life. We treat it as something almost cauterized and separate. So I think yep, yep. everyone has mental health. But also, I think celebrate the good rather than always focusing on the bad. Have fun with it. And good mental health is the best thing in the world. I think fundamentally, because it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, powerful, respected, if you have good mental health, you're functioning at your peak and you can deal with stuff so much better. So that's why I think comedy should be front and center when dealing with mental health, because I can't think of a better way of describing good mental health other than getting together with a group of mates, having a laugh, at everything that life throws at you and coming up with examples of dealing with that. Uh, are we, can we expect an Australian tour anytime soon but from you? You know, it's really bad. My agent keeps on trying to get me to go to Oz, but I am such a child. The idea of being on a plane for 24 hours terrifies me. Uh, Isn't that ridiculous? So if we could like tow australia somewhere just like to the mid pacific or so you know like it can be done yeah let's make it happen everyone listening this is what we need to do okay we need to get dave out here okay and we need to let's tow australia start a campaign hashtag tow australia (laughs) (laughs) that's great i like that well you know dave i it's been really good talking with you and i so many good points in this you know there's so many good points you know i think you know talking about your own story you, you know your comedy and and that positive perspective on on recovery i mean for all the listeners out there like what how what would be the take home you'd kind of want them to get from this it's a great question i think the take home would be Whether you are listening to this, whether you are worried about your own mental health or worried about somebody else's mental health or not even worried at all, everybody has mental health and it's a lot easier to maintain something rather than build it from the ground up. You don't have to be unfit before you start going to the gym. Don't wait to become unwell before you look after your mental health and have fun with that project, whether that is having a feel good folder of photos or memes or jokes on your phone or maybe a youtube playlist let's focus on the good because it's a lot easier to try and deal with stuff when it ain't so good when you've been talking about it when you are functioning at your peak well thank you for taking the time today dave 
Thank you, Jack. Good man. Thank you, man. Keep up the brilliant work as well. I love this. My guest today was comedian and author David Chawner. Tune in next week where we talk with the mother of a daughter with anorexia. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.